Nikon has always been known for making cameras that were super tough and durable and really became the um, kind of the standard for photojournalists. Now, today we're going to look at the Nikon F2. I've got a couple of them here. These are um, well-used cameras. They uh, were owned by a photojournalist and used for quite a time. They, um, they have the battle scars. But the F2 is just a, a fantastic camera, just super durable. They, they just kept working. They could stand all kinds of abuse and deliver, deliver the goods. So we're going to take a look at a couple of these um, and see what you think. I think they're a great camera to buy if you're looking for a used you know, 35 millimeter uh, SLR and you want something that's pro quality, not terribly expensive, super durable, and has some really great features. So we're going to take a look at these, see what you think. Okay, today I've got, I've got a couple of these Nikon F2s we're going to be looking at. Uh, this one is a, uh, an F2 Photomic, and this one is an F2 SB. And we're going to talk about the differences between those. There's actually a number of variations, and they, it all really has to do with the type of viewfinder they have. The rest of the camera is pretty much the same, but the viewfinder's evolved over time. Um, so we're going to take a look at these. So the F2 was introduced in 1971. It was the successor to the very very successful Nikon F. Um, they needed an updated pro quality camera that had some features that were in demand and uh, this is what they delivered. Just a really fantastic camera. Let's talk about some of the differences between the versions. So the, the basic F2 just had a non-metered prism. It was just called an F2. And I mean they made other kinds of finders. They made waist level finders and, and magnifying finders and other stuff but most people got a metered prism, this type of finder. So 19, from 1971 to 76, you could buy the F2 Photomic, and that's this finder here. Now the F2 Photomic, um, and, and these, these, these prisms all pop off, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute, but the F2 Photomic had uh, CDS or cadmium disulfide photocells in it. Um, if you look in the viewfinder, you really can't, I can't have, a, I don't have a good way to like show you what that looks like, but you could of course see the view that the camera saw, and at the bottom, Slightly to the left, there was a, uh, a little window. You could see the aperture that the lens was set at. And then just to the right of that was a little meter needle swinging in a little slot. You could see the tip of the meter needle, and there's a plus and a minus on either side of it. And you, so you could see when it was centered, the way the slot's designed, you can see where the center is. And basically, that meter needle told you when you had the right shutter speed and aperture. And, you know, pretty basic, but it, it worked, and it was durable. And then... The next one that came along was the F2S from, I think, 1973 to 76. Um, and instead of a meter needle, it had LEDs to do the, to show you whether you were, there was three LEDs. So there's, you know, a plus LED and a minus LED, and then the one in the middle that, you know, was your correct exposure. And it still used the CDS photocells. And then this meter prism came along. This is the DP3 meter. Okay, so this is a DP1, that's the official part number. Then the DP2 was for the F2S. The DP3 is for the F2SB. That's this camera. And it also used the LEDs uh, like the um, DP2, but it used new silicon photo transistors or photodiodes for photo sensors. The difference being that they respond much faster and they don't have any memory. So with a CDS meter, if you're in really bright light and you go indoors to where it's not very bright, it takes a few seconds for the photocells to kind of adjust, kind of like your own eyes. You know, you go in from a bright room to a dark room and, and your eyes take a minute to adjust. So the silicon photodiodes react faster. They don't have that kind of lag or memory and um, they're very accurate. So um, the F2SB was made between 1976 and 77. Um, then there's two other versions after that. There's the uh, F2A that used a finder called a DP11. And it basically, um, so the, these meters, and I'm just going to show you here, couple with the lens, you can see this little fork on the lens right here. And there's an arm on the, on the prism that actually goes into that. So there's a little arm that you can see right there at the top, the little pin that sticks down. It actually comes, I don't know if I can make it come out, but it actually swings with the lens. And you can see the little fork on the lens right here at the top. And so when you mount the lens, that would engage with that pin, and then you can kind of see if I swing it one way or the other, the pin follows it. And that's how it indexed with the meter. And that was that's what we now call pre-AI. 
uh, lenses that were made for that, all they had was this little fork on top. Later on lenses came out that were what we call AI, and then there's even AIS. But the AI lenses have this little ledge, if you can show it, there's a little ledge on the aperture ring right here. And there also has the fork. And so the AI lenses actually use this little ledge on the aperture ring, this little step. That's a good way to show that. There it is. You see that little step right there. Uh, they use that step to index with the meter. So when you put the, the lens on, it didn't have a pin that it engaged with. It just, there was a little piece that stuck down and that, that ledge moved it back and forth. So um, the DP11 finder used the AI meter coupling and had the meter needle. And then the DP12 finder, which is for the F2AS, um, had the same AI coupling, but also had the LEDs. So there's, there's those versions of it. I, but the F2A and the F2AS came out in 1977 and ran to 1980, which I think was about the end of the F2, and, and shortly after that, the F3 came out. And that may not be an exact date on, on when they ended production on the F2. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if the F2 and the F3 weren't available both simultaneously for a little while uh, as the F3 was, you know, accepted by the, the photojournalist crowd. And um, so, yeah, you put one of these on, if you've got the one with the little fork, you put the lens on and then you swing it um, all the way to its maximum aperture and back to make sure it sets the prism inside as to what the maximum aperture is. So, the, um, these prisms had a... There's a little button and lever here that you can use to disengage the prism. There's a button here that's your battery test. I don't have batteries in these right now. They use a pair of LR44 batteries, which are still very current available batteries. And um, the camera body has no electronics in it. The battery power just is passed up to the meter, and it's strictly for the meter. You can take these off. You, you basically push in on this deal, and you turn it downward. And then there's a, it takes a two-handed deal. There's a button on the back here that's got kind of a slot that goes crossways. You have to get your thumbnail or something into that. If I can do this, and you can take the prism off. And then if you want to take the viewing screen out, you turn the camera upside down and press that button, and the viewing screen will pop out. So you can change this, have interchangeable viewing screens, or if you just need to clean it, you could dust it off. And then basically, you, you drop it back into the camera, and um, you have to get it in there straight and press this button again, and it'll, it'll settle down in there. There it goes. And then you can put the prism back on, and the prism, you notice the shutter speed dial here has a pin that sticks up. You can see the little pin right there. And the meter dial has a notch in it right there. And so when you join this back together, you have to press these back together, and then you have to turn this dial so that they uh, re-engage so that they latch together. Now the on-off switch for this camera was just by pulling the wind lever out enough so you could see the red dot on the top of the camera. That turned the meter on, that turns it off. If you leave that out it'll run the batteries down if you leave it that way for a while. Matter of fact, one of these cameras I did have batteries in because I had been testing it and I left the lever out and I picked it up this morning and I'm like, oh the batteries are dead. So I took them out. Okay, so this camera had some really neat features besides the removable prism, which was really cool. Um, you, and again, you could get a waist level finder, you could get a chimney finder, you could get um, special focusing screens. Not only, you know, this, these have just the um, uh, split image in the middle, but you could get the micro prism, you could get um, the split image with the micro prism, you could get just plain ground glass. Um, they had special screens for microscopes and all kinds of stuff. The cameras are. If you look back through the history of the F2, it's a, it's a total system camera. There's a zillion accessories available for these things. A um, couple of weird kind of quirky things. I don't have a hot shoe, right? It's like, where do I put my flash? Well, you had to have this accessory. This little piece, you notice around the wind lever, or wind, rewind knob rather, there's a kind of a dovetailed um, mount here. And you had to have this little doodad. <laughs> I'm sure there's a part number for it. Some Nikon aficionado is going to tell me what it is, I'm sure. But this slides over that thing, that uh, mount on around the rewind knob, and then you turn it so it locks it on. And now you have a hot shoe. I don't know, it seems to me a little weird, but that's, that's not untypical of Nikons to do that kind of thing with their flash. Um, 
it's not like it was an afterthought. I'm, I'm sure they thought of it from the very beginning, and I wouldn't be surprised if this little thing didn't come with every camera. I have a couple of them. I have one with each camera, but uh, I'm sure they could also get lost. If you're not shooting flash much, if you're just out like doing street photography and stuff like that, you just leave it off. But if you're going to use a flash, then the the kind of bad thing about it, I guess, is when you go to rewind your film, and this is very typical of any 35 millimeter camera to rewind the film. You push this button here on the bottom and then turn your crank until um, it's done rewinding. And um, so if you have a flash on here, you have to take that off each time you want to rewind the film. So um, again, this uh, camera has a lot of interesting features. So this is a, a the shutter on it's a horizontal traveling shutter like on a lot of earlier cameras, so that you see the shutter curtains, I'm going to set a slower shutter speed here, like an eighth of a second, and you can see the shutter curtains open and close, right? So you can see when I wind them back, it travels horizontally. And these are rubberized metal foil, and unlike some early metal shutters, like this old Canon 7 rangefinder camera, um, these curtains are much more durable. So the early a lot of the early metal foil shutters, you can see how wrinkly that is. There's wrinkles all over that shutter curtain. And it doesn't hurt anything. You can take a Canon 7 or a P or a 6 or any of those that have wrinkled curtains. They work just fine. And if you, if you ever go to buy one of these, uh, we're going to cover this camera in the future. But if you ever go to buy one of these and the curtains are, I mean, if there's holes or cracks or tears in it, obviously that's a problem. But as long as they're not damaged, if they're just wrinkled, it doesn't hurt anything. But it's still, it's ugly. And I'm sure that, you know, not something Nikon wanted to have. And even the Nikon F, I think it also had metal shutter curtains, um, but they, the way they developed them, they don't tend to get wrinkled. These are nice and smooth and flat, and obviously these cameras have been used a lot. So, to open this, it doesn't have a latch on the side, you have to turn this key on the bottom. So you turn that one way and it folds. To open it, you flip the key up and turn it, and then there's a kind of a last little bit you have to like, it's against like a spring. You pop it and it opens the back door. This camera had motor drive capability. So there's a motor drive coupler here. And these days with film so expensive, I don't know if there's too many people wanting to like zip through a whole bunch of film with a motor drive. But news photographers really use those because they didn't have to wind. They could shoot, 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 you know, just like you do with your digital camera. And I think if you're going to shoot something with fast sequences and fat, go use your digital camera. The film is just so expensive. Still, if you're wanting to shoot film, this is a great camera, even without the motor drive. Yeah, so if, if you want to search out a motor drive, I think there's a couple of different versions of motor drives for these. It makes the thing even heavier. I did not weigh these. You can look it up if you're curious, but if you don't like heavy cameras, this might not be for you. This thing's pretty hefty. Okay, so uh, a couple other cool things. This has shutter speeds from 10 seconds to 1 2,000th of a second and no electronics, which I think is totally cool. So if you look at the shutter speed settings on the back of the shutter speed dial here, uh, you can see it goes down here to bulb, and then there's one second and two, and you know, it goes on up until you get to a two thousandth of a second, right? So that's, that's pretty cool. But I said 10 seconds, right? So the way you get 10 seconds, or up to 10 seconds, you set this on bulb, and on top here, you've got this ring around the shutter release button. And you notice it's got L and it's got T, and there's a kind of a position in the middle. But if you switch this over to T, the T position, then your self-timer, you notice the self-timer has numbers around it, right? And so if you swing this down to, say, like 8, yeah, it's pretty close to 8 seconds. 8 seconds, like I, I lined up with the number 8 there. And then if I press the button, I'm going to take the lens off so you can actually see the shutter will fire. You have to wind the camera to make it work. And you'll see the self-timer run, shutters open. You get your eight second exposure. And you can have up to 10 seconds. Um, it, it's totally cool. So you can actually have up to 10 second exposures. Now, the F2 is known for having a self-timer that hardly ever fails, but if, if you're wanting to use those long exposures, I'd probably time them, especially if your camera hasn't had a, a recent CLA. Those times could be maybe not exactly accurate. But still, pretty cool feature. You can have up to 10 second exposures with this. Now, uh, a couple other things with this camera. The camera has a mirror lockup and 
depth of field preview. So the depth of field preview is just this button here. And when you press it, you can see this arm moving right here that stops the lens down. But if you, if you press that in and push the top of this lever towards the mirror box, no, pull it away from the mirror box, it lifts the mirror. Okay, why would I want to do that? I can't see through the camera now. Well, if you have this mounted on a microscope or maybe a really long telephoto lens and you don't want any camera vibration, you can lock the mirror up, you know, get everything composed, make sure everything's like you like. You have to have a tripod, obviously. Lock the mirror up, and then when you fire the camera, just, I have it on bulb still, but, you know, you're going to have a, almost a vibration-free picture. I mean, shutter actuation, it's very smooth. So you can lock the mirror up to reduce vibration for long exposures or for high magnification uses uh, where camera movement becomes really ultra-critical. Um, the um, only other thing that's a little weird to me about Nikons, if you've shot about any other brand, you're going to find that the Nikon lens mount kind of backwards. So a lot of cameras, you press the button to unlock it and you turn it counterclockwise, like you're unscrewing it and you take the lens off. And that's typical of a lot of different, like Minolta and Olympus and most of these camera companies, that's the way it works. Nikon, nope, the other way around. You press the button over here and turn it clockwise to take the lens off. And if you're not used to that, that trips people up. They'll push the button and try to turn it the wrong way. So you gotta keep that in mind. It goes the other way. Um, also, I think uh, the focus is, I know compared to my Canons, my Canons, you turn the lens, in which you know, you're looking at it um, from a different point of view, but I'm turning it, from my point of view, top to left, and I would go to infinity. With Nikon, it's top to right is infinity, and the apertures are wide open when I turn the aperture ring, you know, top to left, and then when I turn it top to right, you know, which would be my clockwise, um, I get the smallest aperture. That's backwards of a lot of other brands. So people that, you know, like I've used Canons and I've used Nikons, and, and, and if I get used to using one and then I pick up a Nikon, I'm like, this is all backwards. So, but that's the way Nikons always are, and if you just shoot Nikons, then it's no big deal. But these are just wonderful, durable, bulletproof old cameras. Um, they're known for taking a beating and just keep on working. One thing, one last little weird quirk, you notice there's no hole to screw in a, a cable release. But there are threads around the base of the shutter button. They actually, I have one still left, but they made a little accessory that was a, a round piece that screwed down over this and had a hole in the top for your cable release to screw into. And they even made cable releases, Nikon made them, that actually were made to fit on this. So there is no cable release hole that you screw a standard cable release into, but there is a way to do it. You just have to have that little accessory. I was gonna bring it this morning so I could show it to you, but uh, it's just a little piece about that tall it's chrome, it's got knurling on it so you can turn it, and it fits over that, that, the base of this where it's threaded and screws on, then it has a hole in top of it for a regular cable release. And like I say, if you search online, you can probably find real Nikon cable releases that have that cup. And there's other cameras that have had that over the years. It's not, it's not specific just to Nikon. Uh, early Leicas, like the screw mount Leicas had that, and uh, screw mount Leica copies, like the Canons had it, and there's some others. Um, so it's, it's not a thing that's unique to, Can or to Nikon, but it's, uh, by this point in time, a lot of cameras had a, you know, a button with a cable release socket in it like this. You know, you could just screw your cable release in. So if you do much work on a tripod with a cable release, you're gonna have to have that accessory. Or you could use the self-timer and let the camera set itself off. You can certainly do that. If you're going to use the self-timer on its own, basically you pull this down, you've got your camera wound, you don't press this button, you press this little one here, and then the self-timer will run and fire the camera. There you go. So the self-timer actually has dual function, both as a self-timer and for long exposures up to 10 seconds. So it's just a really cool camera. They made them chrome and black. Um, they made a bunch of different finder variations. Uh, they're just a wonderful camera that, you know, I know some people really like finding cameras that look like they've really been, you know, well used. So I guess they carry it around. They look like they're a seasoned photographer. This will do it. You know, if you find one of these that's got its battle scars, some cool Nikon glass. And that's the other thing, Nikon made a huge range of lenses from their early pre-AI lenses like this 
to their AI and AIS lenses. I don't remember if this is AI or AIS. This is AIS. So AIS means it has this shelf on the lens, and it also has this little notch right here that communicated to the camera the maximum aperture of the lens. Um, so it's, I think that's what it was for. No. This was so that when you set it at the minimum aperture, you could use it for like aperture priority um, or program exposure. So anyway, the, it, was, it just basically activated a little switch on the front of the camera. So um, Nikon's made a huge range of lenses, and Nikon's really been big about backwards compatibility. Up until they got to the digital cameras, all their lenses had this fork. That, you know, so you could take even a newer lens and put it on an older camera, and they would work. And you can still, I believe, in a lot of cases, take older film Nikon lenses and put on some of the Nikon DSLRs. They may not, the aperture may work, uh, but they may not, um, depends on the camera, I think. They may not, obviously they're not going to meter couple because there's no electronics or anything, but you can get them on, you can, you can actually use them. So, Nikon F2, just a, a fantastic old camera. If you're looking for something that's just really bulletproof, it's got tons of street cred, and uh, will definitely bring home the goods. Nikon F2 might be something to look at. Well, I hope you enjoyed looking at these Nikons. These are just a fantastic old camera that just, you know, stood the test of time. And uh, these were, like I say, used by a photojournalist. And uh, be cool if you could go back in time and look and see all the pictures these things have taken. I bet it's a zillion pictures. Anyway, and they still work. Really amazing. Um, well, I, um, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have any thoughts or questions, please don't hesitate to leave me a comment. I always love hearing from you. And as always, thanks for watching.